Hey, Dr. C here. Good to see you again. We're going to have a little different program today. I've been asked by some of the men up at the uh, Senior Center, uh, many of whom are veterans, uh, to tell them a little bit about my experience in the military. Now, why would they even be interested in that? Mainly because my time, the two years that I spent in the Navy, was in ADAC, Alaska. And so uh, most of them had never been to Alaska. So they would like to learn a little bit, not only about Alaska itself and ADAC itself, but also the big contrast between what it was like back when there was an active military presence out there, back in 1942, 43. And contrast that with when I was there where the mission was different. And I was there 1971, two and three, two years. So let's get on with it. I was in what was called the Barry Plan, B-A-R-R-Y. That was named after the Assistant Secretary of Defense at the time. And the Barry Plan was part of military conscript conscription, that is the draft. Every time we had a, a war, we had a draft, which was mandatory, especially ages 18 to 25. But some of them even extended that up to age 40 as well for men and a few women now too. But that was part of the Vietnam conscription, the Berry Plan. Now, if you joined the Berry Plan, which I did, obviously, I could get a partial deferment, which was usually one or two years into your internship and residency. Or you could get a full deferment. So I was fortunate because it was just by lottery, I was fortunate to get a full deferment. So there I was, went to college, medical school four years, went through my residency six years, and now I was ready to go into the Navy. I had my shots, had my exam and all ahead of time. I had to go from Rochester, New York into Buffalo, New York in order to get that done, but that's the way it was. Now, this was the Vietnam era. So what are they gonna do with a fully trained surgeon? Well, obviously, the more likely space you're gonna go when you're in the Navy would be on one of the Navy ships that was out in the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam. So I uh, prepared my wife we, by that time, we had three children and uh, brought them back to the Berkshires uh, where they stayed with uh, their parents. And um, I figured, well, they can spend a couple of years here uh, while I'm in the military. Well, come to find out that the guy who was supposed to go to ADAC, Alaska, wanted to go full-time military and he wanted to get onto the fast track to get uh, a little more pay, basically. Um, so they were left with uh, somebody that they needed on ADAC. Well, guess who got it? Me. The one good thing about it is that it was a, uh, a billet that allowed you to take your family. And so, I got approval for my family to come with me. And in July of, uh, actually at the end of June of 1971, there I went, uh, cross country. We drove out in, a, uh, in an old um, station wagon with me, my wife, three kids, and a dog. And we drove cross country to a place called Bremerton, Washington. That was where I was supposed to report and 
from there, I was going to go up to Anchorage and from there to ADAC. Now, when I got my orders, the orders say uh, I had to report uh, eventually to NAVSTE ADAC. I said, ADAC, where, did, where is ADAC in Alaska? Well, I got out my encyclopedia. Remember, this, this was in 1971. We didn't have the internet then. We didn't have the ability to just bang, bang ADAC in and find out all about it. You didn't. I went to the encyclopedia. Where's ADAC? Well, I couldn't find it. So then they said there's an extension going out, the Aleutian Islands. So I looked there, and damn it, there it was, ADAC Island, three quarters of the way out the chain of the Aleutian Islands. Isn't that interesting? I said, well, let me look into it a little bit more. So I learned a little bit about uh, Alaska before we even went, and I found out, of course, that uh, Alaska was purchased, uh, remember Seward's Folly, uh, yep, he was the uh, Secretary of State back then, and he had purchased Alaska from Russia um, for $7.2 million. What a bargain that was, let's face it. Uh, although many people didn't believe it was a great bargain then, you know. Alaska, initially, and we're not going to talk about the history of Alaska, basically, but there were some major things that happened, two major things, actually. Uh, that happened. Number one was the big gold rush. That was a big deal, that gold rush, you know. Uh, in fact, uh, Klondike gold was, uh, was almost as big as the big gold rush to California. The Klondike rush <coughs> began in 1897. That was a big deal. But getting up to Alaska was an even bigger deal. So the next big thing that happened was to get a road a road up from the states all the way up to Alaska. That made a big difference then, uh, not only for the, 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 the gold rush thing, but also for the economy of Alaska. So initially the uh, army took over as uh, <clears throat> the primary uh, uh, military out there. Uh, and um, up until the 1940, uh, there wasn't a lot of activity going on militarily out there. There was, but not a lot. So, 1939, that's when uh, we, we uh, declared war on Germany. And after the terrible bombing at Pearl Harbor, Remember that, December 7th, 1941. I never forget that date. Uh, we declared war on Japan. And so, what's the big deal? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. So there I was in uh, Bremerton, and uh, it took roughly one week. One week. I had in one week all the training that apparently they figured I was going to need to go out to ADAC, Alaska. That was it, one week. I barely knew how to salute. I barely knew where to put all of the insignias on my, uh, my coat. I was actually, you know, a, uh, a lieutenant commander by that time because I already had 18 years that I had signed up through the Berry Plant, and that all counted uh, towards my uh, enrollment on that. So I was a lieutenant commander. Whoa, great. I was the fifth ranking officer on the island, for God's sakes. So that's, that's beyond that. Nevertheless, I learned a little bit about Alaska first. So when we arrived uh, in Bremerton, one week's time, they had me shipped out to Anchorage. We spent no time in Anchorage, basically. I got put onto a Reeve Aleutian Airline plane with my family and my dog and whatever belongings I had, and whoop, 1,250 miles out to ADAC, Alaska on Reeves Aleutian Airline. 
when I arrived there, it was uh, not unpleasant, but I learned looking at the, uh, the, the hangar that we arrived at, or I guess it's probably called a terminal now. It, it was a poor excuse of a terminal, but nevertheless, that was the ADAC terminal. And I had a big sign there, ADAC Alaska, birthplace of the winds. Now I said, wow, I don't know about this, birthplace of the winds. Uh, and I was told afterwards that there's a thing called a Williwa. And constantly out there, there's a wind, usually 15 to 20 mile an hour wind all the time because you got the cold Bering Sea to the north and a cool North Pacific on the south of that chain going out. And so that creates clouds, creates a lot of wind and a lot of rain. So how much? How much do we get? The, oh, I was going to tell you about the Williwa. The Williwas are the extreme winds. And we're talking here 60 to 100 miles an hour winds. Doesn't happen often, but when the Williwa comes, the winds go in any direction. So the very first thing that they did when we got out there was they issued us the uh, foul weather gear which was waterproof. They also put a strap onto the doors of the car because when one of those winds comes up, it tears the doors right off the car. So they put those straps on the car as well. So that was my initiation to the birthplace of the winds. Now, when I arrived there, <coughs> there was everybody there. All of the military, all of the brass, you might say, the, the CO, the XO, they were all there to greet me. Boy, we're happy to see you. Uh-oh. Uh, so tell me a little bit about the island, I said, because uh, I need to know. And they did. <clears throat> and they did. First thing they did, they brought my wife and family, first of all, to their quarters. Now, the quarters were actually pretty decent. They were on a place they, they called uh, Officer's Hill. It wasn't much of a hill. It was only 20 feet above sea level, but nevertheless, it was a hill. And that's where all of the officers that had families lived, right along there. So we shared a unit. It was a, um, a double unit. And we shared that with the executive officer of the Naval Communication Station. So we got to meet not just one, but two separate families because we were there for two years. Their, their uh, uh, time there was only one year. So that, that's where they brought them. And they brought me to the hospital. And it was a very modern looking hospital. It had two operating rooms. It had uh, a pharmacy. It had uh, 15 beds. <clears throat> um, looked great. I had six medical doctors uh, under me, six nurses, and the dental department. The dental department had six dentists as well. We also had a couple of chiefs that ran everything. The chiefs, if you were in the Navy, you know they run everything. We also, I shared the, uh, uh, the head of the hospital with the administrative head. He was a lieutenant and we once we met I said listen I don't know anything about administration of a hospital. He said don't worry doc we'll take care of that and he did. So we got along beautifully. I wish they could do that nowadays have a medical and administrative division. But the divisions that are there are not necessarily working together, unfortunately. So I don't need to get to dwell on that. So there I was at the hospital, <clears throat> and they, uh, they issued me uh, a, a, a truck because my car hadn't yet come 
on the, on the uh, transport ship yet. So uh, there I was. The very first thing that I, I, I learned, I had to learn the military etiquette. And I had to learn the island etiquette. I had to learn the island language as well. And there are a number of things I needed to know. First of all, there were constant low-grade earthquakes there. Now, there wasn't a big earthquake since 1951, which destroyed part of the military uh, establishment there. Fortunately, all of these were very low. Uh, military, uh, the earthquakes were between two and three uh, on the Richter scale. So they weren't bad, but all of the housing that was put up was put up on what they call rollers, so you had no damage usually within the house. But you could feel the earthquakes. And that occurred almost daily, some type of little earthquake on the island. And so I learned about earthquakes. I learned about tsunami. And I had trouble even spelling tsunami at the beginning, but a tsunami is like a big tidal wave that's due to some disturbance, uh, like an earthquake, uh, in that North Pacific area. And so I learned about tsunamis. That was important on the island because all of the enlisted housing was right at sea level. It didn't take an awful lot of a tsunami to flood the place. And so we needed to know all this and what to do, how to evacuate properly and get up to the higher ground. Now, Adak Island itself is a very interesting island. And uh, I should tell you just a little bit about Adak. It's uh, roughly 32 by 22 miles in, uh, in uh, its size. It is a volcanic island, and there is a, an old inactive volcano at the north end of the island. It's called Mount Moffat. It's roughly 3,950 feet. Now, you contrast that, say, with something around here like uh, uh, Greylock Mountain, which is 3,490 feet. So it is a taller mountain. It's a big mountain. And we could see it every day from where we lived. There's usually about 100 inches of snow a year, but not on the ground, because the snow is always coming down horizontally in any direction. And so it doesn't stay in one spot. It drifts. It goes back out to sea. So, but during the winter, actually more than just the winter, but during the colder season, I should say, there's always a covering of snow. <clears throat> There's a lot of rain, obviously. It rained 263 days a year. Rain. Not necessarily snow, but rain. So you have to consider that. The temperature was never really too high or too low. It ranged between a low of about 32 to a high of about 50 in the summertime. 50 was nice and warm. It was beautiful. We had, I think, for the time I was out there, for the first year, we had six days of sun. Six days. Where we could go out, take loads of pictures, call it a holiday. That's what we did. So that will give you some idea, at least, of some of the terrain and all in, uh, in uh, ADAC. There are some roads. Most of the roads were, um, well, they had to be uh, evened out every, almost every week. So they had plenty of uh, equipment out there to get the roads, um, I guess, rut-free is what I'm trying to say. So roughly 125 miles of uh, road and about uh, 12 to 13 miles paved. And that's only in downtown ADAC. So that's where our hospital was in downtown Adak, and it was uh, fairly uh, close to the commissary, and, uh, and which made it very nice for us as well. 
But the commissary, remember, only got food when the ships came in, which usually was about once every couple of weeks. Everything came in frozen. So we had frozen milk, frozen, frozen everything. But you learn to live with it. And we did. We relied on each other, which was an important factor out there. How many people on ADAC back then? Well, uh, back then, we had, uh, I would estimate, roughly about 4,300 people. That included a lot of children. We had a school, an ADAC school, that had, uh, I believe, I had the number here somewhere, uh, about 508 children. And that was from kindergarten through fifth grade. A lot of kids. And the teachers would be brought up from Washington or Oregon. In other words, they, were, they just got their degrees, their educational degree. And usually a husband and wife combination would come up for a year or maybe more to teach. Obviously, the pay was very good. And so they could put away a lot of money by doing this. So they would come up and they had quarters nearby the, uh, the school. Two of my boys went to uh, ADAC school. They, they uh, gave it the name of uh, Bob Reeve. It was the Bob Reeve Memorial. Uh, well, it wasn't a memorial school at the beginning. Bob Reeve was a bush pilot in, uh, in Alaska, one of many. But he was probably one of the more famous bush pilots out there. Uh, he came out to uh, ADAC on two occasions. Both of the occasions where uh, uh, he, he supported the Boy Scouts and the Cub Scouts. So he would come out, for example, when the Pinewood Derby was being run for the Cub Scouts. And so that's where I got to meet Bob Reeve. And he, in fact, dedicated and wrote in a book for me, uh, dedicated to uh, Ann and Jerry Claremont. So you know, I still have that book. It's called Glacier Pilot. So if you want to read about bush pilots and all of the things that you need to know about a bush pilot, that's what you get. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about who's on that island now. Well, I was assigned to the Naval Station. Now the Naval Station in the 1970s had a different mission than the Naval Station back at wartime. And I want to make a contrast now of what it was like to be on the island in the 1940s, 42, 43, and what it was like in 1971, 73. Big difference. Two major, major differences. Let's talk for a moment, though, about what was on the island. We had the Naval Station, roughly about 3,100 uh, men and women now on the island. And uh, the purpose then uh, was to support all of the activities going on on the island. Remember, this was during the Cold War. You remember the Cold War. Uh, and, uh, well, some of you do, some of you don't. And I'm, I'm talking to everybody. You need to learn about a little bit about the coal workers. We're going through a kind of a period of this right now with Russia. So this was a Cold War time. So there was a lot of surveillance going on on both sides, both sides. ADAC was a primary area for surveillance of Russia, especially the Russian submarines. The Aleutian Islands are a chain of about, uh, I think about 270 islands going out in a big line out towards Russia. Now, the closest part at the end of the islands, which was at two, the closest thing then was the Kamchatka Peninsula of Russia. And there was a big naval submarine base in the Kamchatka. And so that submarine base then 
was the source of a lot of the surveillance that the Russians were doing with us. So how were we doing our surveillance? Well, number one, we were now a naval air station. We had P-3 Orions, which was a, a, a patrol. That's what the P stands for with the VP, patrol. If it was an attack squadron, it would be a VA. Uh, and they had VN for, for the people who were training and all. But basically, VPs and the Orion. They were electras. They were excellent planes, but this was all uh, set up with um, all of the surveillance material. So they would go out on patrol twice a day and patrol the North Pacific and Bering, uh, looking primarily for any activity from Russia. So that was one of the primary purposes of the naval station. In addition to supporting other things. There was a naval communication station. Now this right at the beginning, even before we were there, that was just a very small part of the entire ADAC community. Back in 1950 now, it was decided <clears throat> with the Cold War we needed to improve the communications. Not just the communications with ourselves. We communicated, for example, with all of our, our planes, communicated with our uh, ships, communicated with uh, the naval bases along the uh, chain, communicated with Kodiak, communicated with uh, Anchorage. All of those communications started or were embellished by the Naval Communication Station. And they had a big thing called White Alice, which are these big uh, discs that you, uh, you may see. And we have a, a slide of those. White Alice is out of date now because now we have satellites. And uh, you don't need these big uh, discs anymore. But we had a White Alice. And we had uh, a, a chain of uh, a big fence, a fenced-in area as well. And all these were part of the Naval Communication Station. And they had six to 700 men who were assigned to the communication station as well. We also had a naval facility. Now, the naval facility <clears throat> did underwater surveillance. What they did is they listened to the bottom of the ocean. And they could hear the propellers, for example, of any type of ship that's out there. And they could tell, based on all of their uh, surveillance equipment, <clears throat> what type of device, whether it was a, from a submarine, whether it was a US submarine, whether it was a Japanese submarine, whatever submarine was out there, uh, they would be able to detect it. So that's the purpose of the naval facility. You didn't need a lot of men sitting there. They're sort of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the people like now who, who are sitting at their damn computers eight hours, 12 hours a day. They had 12 hour shifts reading all of these things because there was a whole series of cables <clears throat> that were out there in the ocean that were laid by their ships. So that was the naval facility and they had about 25 to 30 men at the naval facility. We also had a Marine Corps out there. Now, the Marines, uh, they did their, our security. Now, one thing, and there were about 150 to 250 men, depending on uh, the time. We had about 150 men at the time we were out there. And they not only secured the base, but they never told us, never told anybody on the base what they were doing. They were actually guarding nuclear warheads that were stored on ADAC. We didn't find out about that until way after, after we were there in the 1970s, that there were 70 nuclear warheads that they were guarding. We were a nuclear storage facility. And so the uh, Marines who were guarding them 
they were authorized to shoot first with any activity around those nuclear warheads. Boy, we didn't know that. I'm glad we didn't know that, probably. But we had Marines there as well. And so, what else did we have besides that? Well, we also had a Coast Guard station. Now, the Coast Guard was out on the end of the island. We were in the north half of the island. There was a huge south half of the island as well. And that's basically uh, where most of the tundra was. That's where the caribou were. All of this stuff was down on that the south side of the island, which was not inhabited. But on the end of the north side of the island, that's where the Coast Guard station existed. Also, the Coast Guard had a vessel. It was called the Balsam, a big uh, Coast Guard uh, vessel. And they basically monitored the sea. Mostly, uh, if there were any problems out there, they were on, on the scene to help. But they also were out there for surveillance as well. So that if somebody, for example, uh, while we were there, we had uh, two of the Russian ships that came in uh, to port, brought in by the Coast Guard, because they were fishing, quotes, fishing too close. They got within that border that, uh, that you're not supposed to come in and fish within so many miles of the facility. So they brought them in. So that was the purpose of the Coast Guard, and they had roughly 25 to 50 men, depending on the time of year, et cetera, as well. And they were there for roughly about uh, one year at a time. We also had contractors. They, were, they did most of the building. <clears throat> now, we have also had contractors even back with the World War time, which we will mention as well. So we had roughly about uh, 300 contractors at once. Well, mostly they were the men working there, uh, but they were putting up different facilities all the time on the island. Uh, I got to meet some of them as well. Um, a fellow by the name of Walsh. Good Irish name, right, Walsh? But uh, he was the primary contractor uh, for the island. And then we also had uh, some ancillary personnel. For example, people who worked on the base. Um, they worked permanently on the base. Of course, they took vacations, but they were there all the time, and they knew a lot of what was going on in the vicinity. And we also had, with our school and all, we had children coming in from some of the Aleut communities. For example, uh, Atka. There was an active little community of Aleuts in, in Atka, and their kids came to school on ADAC. And they came on the uh, Navy Tug. Navy Tug went to uh, uh, these islands usually once every two weeks, and they would do transports of the children who went to school on ADAC as well. So that's, uh, that's kind of the general idea of the island. So let's talk a little bit about, um, talk a little bit about the World War II experience. Now, when I first went there, I read a lot, but I didn't really get into it that much because there wasn't a lot of material written about the Japanese side of the experience. The Japanese, after Pearl Harbor, um, had most likely, where we don't know for sure what their plan was with the Aleutian Islands, but they were very close to Japan, and that could be a springboard to come in to Canada and the United States, if they could, for example, take most of that part of Alaska, the Aleutians especially. And so, there was an admiral, his name was Admiral Kakuda. He took his uh, orders from uh, Admiral Yamamoto, which, and he was the head of the uh, entire Pacific Japanese fleet. And so 
Admiral Kakuda had his plan. His plan was to, uh, first of all, they were going to bomb Dutch Harbor, which was one of the first uh, islands out there in the Aleutian chain. It's clo close, to, uh, close to Kodiak. And there was a known base, Army base and Navy base on that island. So they were going to bomb Dutch Harbor. Then they were going to occupy Attu, which is right at the end, Kiska, which was next one up, and then Adak. That was their plan. So in 1972, they did in fact go and they bombed Dutch Harbor. It wasn't the easiest thing to do because of the weather. They were very limited, but they did successfully bomb twice, two days, Dutch Harbor. And they did inflict damage on many of the structures in Dutch Harbor. And we did lose men. We lost men to that as well. Now we did have a, a small naval air force on another island right next to Dutch Harbor. And they did engage, but that was a very minimal engagement because of weather again. It was a very, very difficult uh, flight back then. So back in, in June of 1942, um, that's what happened uh, at Dutch Harbor. We actually lost um, 78 men with that uh, bombing, and we lost 14 planes. It wasn't insignificant. Yes, if you look at the entire war, war, it's very small significance, but nevertheless. Then they took the second part of their plan. They were going to take Attu, Kiska, and Adak. First, they invaded uh, Attu. That was the last island, uh, and the closest island, actually, to, um, to, the, uh, to uh, Japan. So they, t they went into Attu. Um, at the time, there were only 39 people on the island of Attu. They are mostly just there for surveillance, like Coast Guard, for example, that type of thing. And so they uh, landed <clears throat> with 2,500 Japanese, uh, or Japanese men and very easily took over the island. And uh, in addition to that, the next day they went into Kiska and took that island. And uh, there were only 10 people on Kiska at the time, and uh, so it wasn't a, a difficult fight. The natives that lived on those islands got sent to a concentration camp in Japan. And unfortunately, half of the natives who got sent uh, died uh, at the concentration camp. So our, they tried to get into ADAC, but because of weather, never really accomplished very much. They tried to bomb it, but it never really materialized well. What happened on the American side? Well, now America woke up. They said, geez, you know, uh, they've taken a couple of our islands. I don't know what their plan is. They bombed Dutch Harbor. We've lost a number of men already. We need to get our act together. So all of a sudden, a lot of men got sent up to Alaska, and bases were then established. Adak happened to be one of the good natural harbors. And so Adak was chosen <clears throat> because not only was it a good harbor, but it was also much closer to Attu and Kiska. And so you could take off and come back with that one, with one fueling. So that was uh, the base then that was decided upon. All of a sudden, a number of men got sent to uh, ADAC. The first ones to arrive on ADAC just did an exploratory. They uh, 
corroborated the fact that the, uh, the bay, the Kulak Bay, was deep enough to uh, take all of the military ships. But there, were, there was an air need as well. So what did they do? They got some Seabees. Now these Seabees came in. They lived in tents on the island. They built a nice airport in 10 days. In order to do this, now remember, down by the uh, ocean itself, it was all sea level, sea level there. It wasn't up into the highlands. It was all sea level. So at high tide, that could flood. So they had to build dikes, they had to divert some water, and they built a beautiful 2,500-foot <clears throat> runway, just big enough so that the military air transports could land on ADAC. And they used not only the bulldozing and got it nice and flat, but then they put this Marsden matting, which is very heavy steel uh, that looks, uh, looks like a bunch of figure eights <coughs> all the way down, laid that right down, uh, and they made the first airway. Now, they didn't stop working just because that was there. But besides the Seabees now, all of the other personnel could come in. And so they now started to bring in men. In order for the men to live, they had to put up Quonset huts. Quonset huts can be put up very rapidly. And it's a very efficient way of doing it. They can put them up in ruts, in between little hills, so that it's half buried. That helps to protect it from the bombs and, and a lot of the shrapnel in there. And it's got a, a steel cover to it. Usually they're, they range in size, but it could be 100 feet long, 110 feet long, by maybe uh, 16, 20 feet wide. That's the, uh, that's the base. And so they put up a whole bunch of these Quonset huts. They also, uh, in preparation for war, built a little underground hospital. The underground hospital at the peak, back in 1942 at the peak, that hospital, uh, which now was, like I said, underground, and they connected a whole bunch of these Quonset huts they could actually accommodate up to, up to 1,500 wounded men. That's a lot. In order to accomplish this also, um, they had to have personnel. So they brought up several doctors and nurses to stay and to man these Quonsets, these, this hospital. Each Quonset <clears throat> had a different purpose. One did surgery, another medical. Each one had a purpose to it. Okay, so that was in preparation. So then what happened? Well, in June of 1943, we had, we invaded Attu. We wanted to get this island back. This was a bloody, bloody island. It was a terrible fight. The Japanese were totally entrenched, that, those 2,500, totally entrenched in that island. Unfortunately for them, they had no longer any means of getting any supplies. So even though they were entrenched, they were pretty isolated. So we invaded that island then with uh, roughly about 11,000 men. So they got brought in, and it took 19 days to take the island. We had a lot of casualties in that. In fact, we had something like uh, 25, I'm sorry, uh, 3,900 casualties. Now, the casualties, 3,900, there were a lot. A lot of men died in that. But half of the people who were wounded, half the men who were wounded, actually didn't come in from war wounds. They came in with trench foot, 
frostbite. They lost pieces of their toes and fingers. Um, half, half of all the casualties like that were <coughs> the environment, were due to the environment. They brought them all into ADAC for treatment. Okay, 19 days. At the end, the Japanese saw no way that they could save the island, save it, and so they did a big bonsai. They came running, and most of them got killed, 2,500 total casualties, because they were not going to be captured. That was it. Very soon afterwards, we now sent people into Kiska. We wanted to get that island back. And so, in uh, August of 1943, supposedly, we had the Battle of Kiska. The Japanese, however, had two months. And in that two months, they took all of the Japanese out of Kiska. There wasn't a single one left. They left a note there. It's yours, Yank. That's what they said. But the Americans didn't know that. 34,000 American combat men went into Kiska. Believe it or not, never had to sh shoot a, a Japanese because there, there were none there. But despite that, we had almost 300 casualties. People either shooting themselves shooting or bombing our own men, or again, frostbite, trench foot. A lot of casualties for a non-battle. That was the last major battle for the Aleutian Islands. That whole thing now is called the Thousand Mile War. And there's a book written about it which I would advise people to do if you have that historical uh, need. It's a very good book, Thousand Mile War. So after that battle, well, so-called battle, in August of 43, ADAC was still in existence. It still was the stopping point for a lot of the men who went out and fought on Attu and Kiska. At one point in time, they said there were up to 90,000 men on this single island of Adak. And how many women? 12 nurses. That was it. What did the men do between, say, September of 43 and 1945 with the end of the war? What did they do? We sort of forgot them. I mean, by the we, I mean our military. Forgot about them. When we had a need for them, they mobilized quickly. They got things put up quickly. They sent everything out there. But they didn't do much after that because there was nothing going on. And so, that was a sad part of the Thousand Mile War. The men, nothing to do. And so, what did they do? They put up pictures of Betty Grable, put up pictures of Rita Hayworth. They would get some porn films in, uh, and they got sold at a huge price. They, uh, the chiefs got together, got some uh, uh, bootleg brought in. Uh, the chiefs, you can't do without them. And so they would sell that at a premium. So I really feel sorry for the men who are out there. Now let's contrast that with me in 1971. Like I said, now the purpose was different. It was no longer wartime. It was a cold war now. We were there for surveillance. We were there, like I said, the Marines were guarding nuclear warheads that could be delivered. In fact, the P-3s 
had now attachments they could deliver these underwater uh, nuclear warheads to hit, uh, for example, uh, a submarine. And so that's why we were there. We were also there for communication as well, as I mentioned. What sort of things did we have when I went out there in 71? Well, we had a lot of good stuff out there. It no longer was that cold, muddy, desolate island with no women. What did, they, what did we have? Well, for example, <clears throat> we had a football field, a baseball field. We had a little league team that was out there. We had a school, like I said, 509 children in, in, in kindergarten to five. This was in 71. We had uh, uh, Cub Scouts. We didn't have Boy Scouts at that time. We did have Cub Scouts. We had people who went out on hunts because we had plenty of uh, material they could hunt. And we, every year we had a uh, a one-month period where we could hunt caribou. Originally, there were 28 caribou that were brought onto the island, and by now, we had over um, 1,500 caribou on the island. Getting overpopulated, needed to have a little hunt, so we would have a designated time to go caribou hunting. We could also uh, we had a little ski lodge because we could go up towards Mount Moffat and ski. Um, we had a, a, a hobby shop, a bowling area, an exercise area, a big swimming pool. We had a theater. We even had a local TV channel. Of course, it was all military TV, but it was a channel. In fact, I went on to that channel because I ran a, a football program. Uh, every Sunday, I would go up to the communication station, get all of the scores from Saturday and Sunday, and I would have a program, a football program, and give everybody all of the scores and all, and moan and groan about the, uh, the, uh, the scores, of course. I didn't know that much about some of them, but the people seemed to enjoy that uh, quite a bit. Every month, we had a hail and farewell. And every month, a certain uh, number of us would be responsible for running the hail and farewell. For example, the medical dental unit, uh, maybe every six months, we would run the hail and farewell. Oh, I love the happy hours. 25 cents to get a drink during happy hour. That wasn't, wasn't good for most of the men. Uh, there were a fair alcohol consumption going on back then, but nevertheless, um, we had a daily happy hour at the bachelor quarters, the BOQ. Besides the BOQ, there was one for the chiefs, and also one for the enlisted men, and one for the marines. Marines were called the Tundra Tavern. So that's how people uh, enjoyed whatever they, they, uh, they could. So a lot of these things were out there then. They weren't out there in 42, 43. Totally different purpose now. Totally different area. So what do I remember about the island? Well, what I remember about it is the rugged beauty of the island, despite the weather. The tundra, the tundra seemed like such a terrible place because there's permafrost under, that's why you can't grow a tree on the tundra. It's just tall grass and stubby bush, that's it. And we, we actually, uh, the general who was out there uh, back in the, in the 40s and all, uh, he took pity on the men, he said, oh, we gotta have some trees out there. So he planted 33 pine trees and they called it the Adak Forest. 33. Only one of them survived, and in the 1960s, a big sign got put up saying, you are now entering and leaving Adak National Forest. That sign is still there. Some of the trees came back, and so every 
Christmas time, the natives who are on the island will still decorate some of the trees. And in front of the trees is a little area where they buried their pets. Remember, I took my dog out there. Unfortunately, I left my dog there that, with the, uh, uh, one of the dental captains. Uh, he was getting older. He was ready to retire. He didn't want to do much moving, and my dog was old. She didn't want to do much moving. So they got along beautifully. I left my dog with him. And I'm sure she's buried out there with some of the other uh, dogs that are out there. While I was out there, I had a veterinary service too. So if you needed to have your dog or a cat spayed, I could do that for you. I could do the dew claws, I could trim the nails, all that sort of nonsense and all, because a lot of people had pets out there. So I was the island vet as well. You gotta do a lot of things when you're out there and uh, that was one of the pleasurable things. Well, besides that, <clears throat> best water in the world. Not like Shrewsbury water. Good water. This was clear water. This was glacier water. Pure water. And you would think that, well, everything that came in frozen, we were all eating frozen stuff. There was a lot of natural stuff too. We had crab boats come in every year and the crabs from uh, uh, Alaska are the king crab, the big king crab. They were allowed to take 75,000 uh, pounds of crab a year. And they would come out, the uh, catcher boats would go out, they had to work. They, they, they put these big cages out uh, with some bait in there. They would pull up the cage, dump it into the hold. They'd come out to the actual processing vessels which were on one of the bays in the island. Well, as the medical officer, I had the responsibility of checking out the, uh, and making sure that it was all healthy, you know, so sort of like what the health department does here with the restaurants, you know, uh, you had some uh, droppings over here, you know, uh, you know, I don't worry, I didn't worry about droppings out there, believe me, uh, it was all directly taking care of the people actually who were on the boats, the processing boats. Well, I got to meet some of the people, I got to meet all of the people actually uh, when I was out there. And whenever I was ready to leave, I would get a bag of the meat that was in the, in the claws and in the arms of the crab. The crab had to be at least six inches across in order to be legal. Some of the crabs we saw were 10, 11 inches. They, they, these were big suckers, they were big. Oh, the meat was right off the processing vessel, never been frozen. Oh, you can never eat anything sweeter or better than that. But they would freeze it there and they would send it back to the States to be sold. Now I also grabbed a few of those big, big crabs and I made a big uh, thing to put on the wall. So I would put a, a big thing with a white background and all. I would use some formaldehyde, stretch out all of the arms. Some of the arms were out there. I mean, they were four feet in length. And so we, uh, we put them on and uh, I sold a few of them as well. But I also brought two of them back with me as well. One of them still sits in my uh, attic. Uh, the other one I think I gave to one of the doctors around here. So uh, that was a wonderful thing as well. So we truly enjoyed the crab that was out there. Also the eagles. Now you say, gee, uh, you've got to look at a distance to see an eagle here. We had eagles galore on the island, galore. Especially if you went to the, to the Adak town dump. We would take pictures of these eagles in various uh, stages. Young eagles, old eagles, gold eagles. Uh, we caught them in flight, caught them grabbing uh, salmon out of the streams. We got loads of eagle pictures. Uh, I think the eagle is a marvelous, uh, a marvelous bird, a huge bird. Well, they were well fed out there on, uh, on ADAC as well. Also, I mentioned the, uh, the eagle grabbing some salmon. We grabbed some salmon too. There would be salmon runs, salmon runs usually in the fall. 
The silver salmon ran at a different time than the coho salmon. They ran at a different time than the uh, pink salmon. Those were the three varieties that came. So we would go salmon hunting, we, salmon fishing, I should say, and we would uh, come in and uh, wonderful, wonderful fresh salmon. I would go to the, uh, the local <coughs> exchange and uh, get a smoker and I would smoke some of the salmon. So we had smoked salmon, fresh salmon, uh, frozen salmon. We had loads of salmon, loved it. I also went halibut fishing a couple of times, caught 152 pound halibut. We got that all cut up, uh, ate halibut for the rest of our time there. Anytime we would get an inspection coming onto the island, the first thing they would look for would be uh, would you happen to have some halibut around? Well, okay. I always gave them some halibut, and we always got an excellent rating on our inspections, of course. Some of the things that I also remember <clears throat> were the sea otters. Now, you would see these sea otters right around those processing boats, but they, they existed without the processing boats. But you would see them there because they would grab a lot of the residual meat that was discarded from the, uh, from the crabs. They loved to just float on their back, put a, a piece of uh, crab on their, on their belly. They may take a rock out of the bottom, break the, the shell and all, and eat while they're laying on their back, looking very content. We love the sea otters. I took some, some nice pictures of those sea otters as well. One thing I, I always use uh, when, I, when I talk about these things, there's a thing called an usik. Now an usik is a bone that's in the penis of a walrus or a big, uh, uh, <coughs> a big seal. Yeah, an actual bone. And so once I was out walking on the, uh, uh, on the shore, uh, actually, uh, I was trying to dig up some of the uh, clams that were on the, sh on the uh, shore as well. And I saw this uh, dead, uh, dead uh, probably uh, was a big seal, but he had an usik. God, <coughs> okay, I got that usik, and I put it into my little, uh, my little bag, and I still to this date have that usik. So every now and then I will uh, look at that usik, you know, if I wanted to ask somebody, what do you think this is? Well, it's an usik. Well, what, what the hell is that? Yeah. Ah, I had loads of fun with that. I had some other things that I do remember about the island. Uh, I do remember uh, things like uh, Kanakin. Now, Kanakin, you may not realize, but we did a lot of nuclear testing. At first in Nevada, and we're still paying for that. But they did nuclear testing on an island called Amchitka. They did three nuclear tests. This was down about 6,000 feet underground. The test itself, the nuclear test itself, uh, was uh, roughly five megatons. How do you compare that to what was detonated in Hiroshima, Nagasaki? That was only 20 kilotons, kilotons, a thousand tons, not a million tons, like a megaton. This was a five megaton blast that occurred in November of 1971 on Amchitka. Well, we got wind of that, uh, and uh, I put a little note in the, in the, there was a little newspaper that we put out and uh, a little note saying, I know that people aren't worried in the military about blowing off a five megaton blast, uh, but I am concerned. Is this gonna trigger a tsunami? What is gonna be the nuclear fallout of this, if any? Well, all of a sudden the brass were at my door. Why'd you put that in? I said, well, because I've got these concerns about Kanakin. And they left. So all of a sudden, the day before the blast, 
the, de the defense secretary comes into Alaska with his two kids, two girls, and they go out to Amchitka just to prove to us that it's not a problem. The CO of our base comes over to me. You're coming with me. We're going to Amchitka. I said, well, I don't know if I want to go to Amchitka. Yep, you're coming with me. Okay, you don't say no to the CO. Out to Amchitka I go. And we had the blast. All we felt was maybe a little rumble. That was it. That was it. And they did check every six months the nuclear fallout from this. No tsunamis, fortunately. But they carried out two more. They had a series of three subterranean blasts. That was the last nuclear test that we did. So Katakin, I'll always remember, especially since I had to be there for it. Well, I wasn't too happy about it, but uh, it is something that I remember. Now, I do also remember some sad things, too. It's an isolated station. We got extra pay when, when we went out there. Of course, isolation is not isolation like it was in 42, 43. Nothing in comparison. But it was an isolated duty station. There were some enlisted men who couldn't take that isolation. And so there were people who were looking for Section 8s. I'm going crazy. I got to get off this island. So sometimes it wasn't easy to determine whether they had a history of this or not. So I had to go into their old records, etc., and then do a specific interview with them to see if they get, should get sent off the island or not. We had several suicides while we were out there as well. Um, not, not that many when you consider the fact that it is an isolated duty station. I don't know how many suicides occurred during that phase of uh, August of 43 to 45. I'm sure there were. I'm sure there were a lot. But like I said, the military doesn't allow you to get that information very easily. So I couldn't find out at that time. So I guess in summary, I had a heck of a good time for my two years out on, out on ADAC. In fact, I even thought about signing up because they were putting in the oil pipeline at that time. And I could get a job on the oil pipeline as a medical director for over $150,000 a year. Not bad. Not bad. My wife said, no way. My kids said, no way. You go out there, you go out alone. Um, so I decided I better not. So I didn't. Uh, but I do really look back on ADAC with, uh, with some sadness. Right now, it's, a, it's a, not even a naval base anymore, but they do have, the Navy does have the right to come back out there again. And in fact, I think they're thinking about it as well because we're beginning to get into almost like a Cold War situation with Russia again. And so even though right now there's less than 300 people on the island, the only people who go out now are uh, hunty, hunters because some of the uh, uh, ingenious uh, Alaskans now run hunting expositions to get caribou out there. There are fishing ex expositions to go for halibut or, uh, or salmon. Um, but uh, 300 people out there. It, was, it had the uh, honor of being one of the few places where a McDonald's didn't last long. In the 1960s, they uh, put up a McDonald's, and it lasted probably until about the 70s, and that was it. So that's about it. This is Dr. C. I'd be very happy to make this presentation uh, at any of the organizations. Remember Glacial Glacier Pilot, Bob Reeves story. Remember also Thousand Mile War. And then the last one, the Forgotten War.
These are all excellent, excellent books describing how things were back in the Second World War. And I don't think we should forget that there was such a thing as the Second World War out in Adak, Alaska. Have a nice day. This is Dr. C.